How to Read Poetry Like a Professor by Thomas C. Foster. Chapter 4 The Rhythms of the Saints. Feel a little beaten up? I mean, seriously. Meter, I am, and a pest, meter, trochee, meter, blah, blah, blah. For a whole chapter, no less. On the one hand, I feel I should apologize for going all technical here. Why does all that meter business matter? If you are a poet who might wish to write, say, a sonnet, that knowledge is critical. We regular readers, by contrast, will likely never have that level of intimacy with the demands and rewards of meter. Instead, we need language instruction. Every art form has its own language, its own special way of communicating, with a complete set of rules and practices accounting to grammar, to a grammar. We're not talking English here, but the particulars of poem construction. I am, for instance, isn't simply a term to bedevil us from the start, although it may have that effect, but a tool to be used by the poet and therefore understood by the reader. After all, you want to know what's going on, right? Rhythm beyond meter. And now for the payoff. We've been talking about meter, but what about what really matters is rhythm, the beat we feel in poetry. Sometimes sometimes meter provides that, of course, but there are other ways to lay down a beat. One of our finest and first expo- exponents of non-metrical rhythm is Walt Whitman, as here in section 11 of Song of Myself, 1855. 28 young men bathed by the shore, 28 young men, and all so friendly. 28 years of womanly life, and all so lonesome. She owns the fine house by the rise of the bank. She hides handsome and richly dressed aft the blinds of the window. Which of the young men does she like the best? Ah, the homeliest of them is beautiful to her. Metrically, this passage is all over the map. The first line begins trochees, begins as trochees, 28 young, but then slides into an I am, men bathe, but then concludes with an anapest by the shore. We might even see that as twin anapests, young men bathe by the shore, which leaves the stressed eight standing on its own. The next line follows a similar pattern, but line three blows any expectations out of the water. So, what works for managing rhythm here? Several things take place. First, the favorite Whitman strategy, repetition. Beginning those first three lines with the same three syllables launches the poem forward. True, the third line appends what we thought we knew, that 28 would be followed by an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed, young men. Instead, the number is followed by a stressed syllable, years, which brings us up short. Clearly, all the metrical knowledge in the world will not avail to us. Why, you ask? Because Whitman cares not about me- not about meter, but about rhythm. Rather than sticking to an ordained metrical pattern, he is using other stylistic features to impart a sense of rhythm, of music, if you will, to his poem. Repetition is one obvious example of such a feature. Those first two lines begin with 28 young men, imparting a sort of rolling gait to the beginning. This sort of stacking of repeated phrases is more common in oratory, whether political or religious, than in poetry, although it is far from unknown. You can take speeches by 19th century Daniel Webster or 21st century Barack Obama, or sermons by colonial preacher Jonathan Edwards or Martin Luther King Jr. some 200 years later and see how this phenomenon plays out rhetorically and sonically. Another feature is alliteration, words repeating the same opening sound in succession, as in bathe by in line one, or hides handsome in line five. As with any technique, alliteration can easily become heavy-handed, but a few short instances can work magic. A related feature is consonants, the repetition of consonant sounds in close proximity, although not necessarily occupying the same position within words. We see this in the woman's introduction in line three. Womanly life and all so lonesome. Four different uses of L in three different positions. Initial in life and lonesome, termi- and lonesome, terminal in all, and penultimate in womanly, saved from the end by a vowel. At the same time, he reuses the related sounds M and N, which vary only by our lips being closed with one o- and open with the other, in womanly and lonesome. 
and he likes anapests here, especially to end his lines, as in by the shore, the fine house by the rise of the bank, to achieve his desired effect. Leaves of Grass offers hundreds, maybe thousands, of examples of these and other strategies to create rhythm, with st scarcely a regular metrical line to be had. Whitman is making it up as he goes, this business of rhythm. With every new section of his great poem, he must ask himself three questions. What is the music of this part? How can I create it? And what effects will it accomplish? Far easier, of course, to fall back on the tried and true, the traditional metrical forms handed to him by Chaucer and Shakespeare and Wordsworth. You know what this means, don't you? This is an earthquake, even if it's nearly impossible to sense seismic activity 150 plus years on. Since the time of Geoffrey Chaucer, who died in 1400, English language poetry has built its castle on iambic foundation. And here comes this American upstart shaking it to smithereens. That sound you hear? That's the rumbling of the first truly modern poet. American poetry has been rumbling and shaking ever since. Does that mean that the Yanks have a better sense of rhythm than the Brits? Not really. You only have to read Ted Hughes to know that. But it might be possible to argue that they have more experience and superior early examples. I have long maintained that modern American poetry grows directly, or either by affinity or opposition, from Whitman. Modern British poetry, by contrast, grows from seeds planted by two experts at traditional closed-form poetics, Thomas Hardy and William Butler Yeats. Whole schools of poetry, from the pre-World War I Georgian poets to the 50s movement poets, have openly expressed indebtedness to the terse, controlled verse of Hardy, while more or less everyone else had to go through his or her Yeats period when starting out. Even someone as unlike the master as Philip Larkin started out writing bad imitations of Yeats before being part of the Hardy-esque movement. Americans, meanwhile, have not only Whitman to look at, but also a couple of others sprung from the soil originals, Langston Hughes and E.E. E. Cummings. Other Bases for Rhythm Langston Hughes' first published poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers, is quite Whitman-esque in the mix of long and short lines as well as its repetition of key phrases, as in the first two lines. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood and human veins. The repeated initial three words in line two, along with the stacked prepositional phrases, as the world, than the flow, of human blood, in human veins, creates an initial rhythm that organizes the sound of the rest of the poem. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates which, when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. 1921. The verbs change in those middle lines, but the, but the pattern I, verb, followed by some aspect of the river mentioned, remains the same. As with Whitman, those repetitions to start lines create a rhythm of their own. Again, the prepositional phrases run throughout the four lines from in the Euphrates to in the sunset. Each one of those both deepens and rings changes on their use in line two. How? We know, even if we can't name them, the cadence of a prepositional phrase, the three or four word group following in or on, or their numerous cousins, preposition, article, noun, as in under the boardwalk, one of the great musical uses of the form. They are encoded into our understanding of how English sounds. Merely to hear a preposition is to prepare ourselves for the rest of a very familiar pattern. Even more to the point of our discussion, Hughes did three things that contributed to American poetry's e sense of rhythm. First, he introduced African-American dialect as something other than as a source of local color on the one hand or derisive humor on the other. When Hughes employs black English, he does so to establish an authentic voice for some black experience and to find the musicality of that voice. The mother and mother to son, for instance, details her hardships metaphorically from her opening statement that life for me ain't been no crystal stair. 
following through with the catalog of challenges in the guise of issues with more real-life stairway from tacks to splinters to broken treads, all the while asserting that she refuses to give up or stop climbing, however difficult the endeavor. This use of a poetic conceit, a metaphor that extends throughout a poem and controls its imagery, is as sophisticated as anything by those 17th century masters of the device, the so-called metaphysical poets, such as John Donne or, and Andrew Marvel. But it is accomplished with the very unpretentious language of a downtrodden African-American woman. Hughes had his critics, including some in the black community who associated dialect with derogatory depictions of African-Americans in minstrel shows and other forms of popular, usually white, entertainment. His vision, however, would ultimately win out among poets and writers of the second half of the 20th century, from Amiri Baraka to Ishmael Reed to Toni Morrison, who would further explore the musicality of the speech of their people. He was, after all, the inheritor of the traditions of both Walt Whitman and his great predecessor as poet of the African-American experience, Paul Lawrence Dunbar that he would take Whitman's example of sympathy for and understanding of common people and marry that to his own racial community is almost inevitable. Hugh's second source of rhythm in his poems is, unsurprisingly, the black church. He often punctuates his poems with and even organizes around such explosions of faith as glory, hallelujah, and sweet Jesus. Such expressions are not unknown in white churches, of course, but among preachers and congregations of Hugh's experience, those exclamations would be a regular feature of the service. Again, he uses those outbursts in his own way, as likely to populate a poem about social injustice or a beautiful woman as one having to do with salvation. His poems may take the form of someone speaking in church, and those speakers' language will inform the rhythm of the poems. His third great contribution lies in his exploration of the poetic possibilities of jazz and blues. Of course, many poets and lyricists have written four blues or jazz songs. He was not the only poet to attempt to capture this syncopation of jazz or the rhythmic structure of blues. Numerous writers of the Harlem Renaissance were doing the same thing in the 20s. But he may have been the most widely read. And why not? He burst on the scene at virtually the same historical moment as Louis, Louis Armstrong, one of the first crossover stars of jazz, and his poetry is as infectious and lively as an, Amer as an Armstrong performance. He can write a straightforward 12-bar blues, as in poi bo po boy blues, or something more, much more complex, as in the weary blues, 1926, in which the actual blues lines often appear in quotation marks while the longer, more sinuous lines contain elements of the, of the blues, but refuse to hold still for any neat ca categorization. Something more like jazz. Improvisational, rhythmically syncopated, free-flowing. Droning a drowsy, syncopated tune, rocking back and forth to a mellow croon, I heard a Negro play. Down on Lenox Avenue the other night, by the pale, dull pallor of an old gaslight, he did a lazy sway. He did a lazy sway to the tune of those old weary blues. With his ebony hands on each ivory key, he made that poor piano moan with melody. Oh, blues! Swaying to and fro on his rickety stool, he played that sad, raggy tune like a musical fool. Sweet blues! Coming from a black man's soul. Oh, blues! We can find our own way, his poems assert showing our own people in our own language, celebrating our cultural heritage. This passage, lines 9 through 16, captures that moment from the piano moaning to the rickety stool to the raggy tune, two phrases I've yet to find in Shakespeare or Milton. His example would be followed later by jazz poets, oh, by later jazz poets, as otherwise different as Baraka and beat poet Jack Kerouac and Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Once Hughes showed up, the w showed the world what could be done with actual music, especially popular music in poetry, pretty much anything was possible. The third shining example for American poets seeking their own rhythms comes from the utterly strange yet oddly familiar wordbender, E.E. E. Cummings. Buffalo Bill's defunct, 
who used to ride a water smooth silver stallion and break one, two, three, four, five pigeons just like that. Jesus, he was a handsome man. And what I want to know is, how do you like your blue-eyed boy, Mr. Death? First published in 1922, this is a tiny poem. Some things we see more clearly if we print it in a more conventional arrangement. Buffalo Bill's defunct, who used to ride a water smooth silver stallion and break one, two, three, four, five pigeons, just like that. Jesus, he was a handsome man. And what I want to know is how do you like your blue-eyed boy, Mr. Death? In this case, page, page placement is as much a part of rhythm as the pattern of the words. Yes, the natural speaking style and the rat -a -tat delivery, one, two, three, four, five, and just like that, have something to do with it. But it is hard to ignore the pauses enforced by the spatial leaps, either down the page, as in the breaks between Buffalo Bills and Defunct, which occupies the line all its own, or across the page, as when Stallion seems marooned on an island, or Jesus lurks out near the right margin. Coming speeds up speeds us up and slows us down by using spatial placement as punctuation. A semicolon slows us down, so do three inches of blank line. A long time ago, before you were born and even before I was, English poetry used a different rhythm. Okay, not English poetry as we understand it, but old English, although they had no idea of being old. We need to be clear here that old English doesn't mean Shakespeare, early modern English, and it doesn't even mean Chaucer, Middle English. Nope, we're talking about Anglo-Saxon before the Norman Conquest brought a, lot, brought a lot of French elements and made the language sound less like gargling. So, anywhere between the time the Angles and Saxons overran the native Britons, 5th through 7th century CE, and the Battles of Hastings in 1066, what we know about it from the handful of surviving works under 200 considered major or significant, is that it likely it liked strong stresses, alliteration, and short lines, while it cared not a whit for rhyme. You doubt? Try the first three lines of Beowulf. What, we gardena and gardegum, low praise of the prowess of people kings. Something, 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 something. Of spear-armed Danes in, long day, in days long sped. Something, 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 something. We have heard, and what honor the athlings won. The italic lines are the Old English original, which you can't read. The lines in Roman are the translation by Francis B. Goumier from the Harvard Classics, The Five-Foot Shelf of Books, 1910, which is only slightly better. What's an athling, anyway? There are several major features here besides the strange letters. First, note that each line is split in two. That break is called a kaisera, a term we will use to indicate some sort of break in modern cases, usually via punctuation in the middle of a line. Second, the lines are highly alliterative. alliterative. In line one, not only the G from Gardena, but also the erd carry over into the second half line, that's the surprisingly straightforward term, and girdagum. The third element at work involves counting very low counting. Each half line, or diptych, typically has two strong stresses, indicated in our example by the flat line above the vowel. Unstressed syllables don't count at all, so none of that metrical foot noise that have been trouble troubling your dreams. So, count to two, ignore the other syllables, and it's all good. So, why should you care? Well, every once in a great while, some poet takes it into his or her head to get back to basics. Not common, but the results can be spectacular. In the early 1970s, Seamus Heaney undertook to write poems dealing with both the Northern Irish contemporary conflict and the ancient past in something very like the half-line of Anglo-Saxon po poetry. His success in conventional English versification had been somewhat vexed in his early volumes, yet he was unwilling to abandon formal verse altogether. Then, following the outbreak of sectarian violence in 1969, which became known as The Troubles, Heaney decided to marry the cur current climate of violence. Earlier Viking raiders and settlers, who founded Dublin, among other acts, and some very old-fashioned poetics. It worked stunningly. Here he is explaining the artistic choice in bone dreams. 
1975. I push back through diction, the Elizabethan canopies, Norman devices, the erotic mayflowers of Provence, the ivy latins of churchmen, to the scops twang, the iron flash of consonants cleaving the line. He depicts each of these past linguistic and poetic practices in the language and form of the last one. A scop is an Ang Anglo-Saxon performer of poetry who is actually a creation of um, Anglo-Saxon poetry. That is, he seems to have existed only as a depiction of the post performer in Anglo-Saxon poems. No contemporaneous documents exist confirming the existence in the real world, and we know that the poems were written, not recited, in the first instance. Heaney is not scrupulous about having two stresses in every line. But the effect, heavy alliteration, short lines, hard consonants, absolutely captures the spirit of the original. So does his fondness for kennings, those compound nouns that describe a third thing, like whale road for the sea. They seem exotic when we hear originals, but we use kennings all the time, as in our fender bender for a minor accident. English, like other Germanic languages, is tailor-made for jamming nouns together as a way of enriching expression. Notable in this poem is his exploration of Bandhaus, Bone House, a kenning that might seem to suggest an ossuary or charnel house that actually refers to the human body, which houses bones. However, briefly, Heaney decides to take the hus portion literally and thereby treat the body as a house of sorts, replete with walls, roof, and furnishings. In so doing, he acknowledges the tradition while pushing an ironic, postmodern understanding of it. This section, like the others, a set of four-spaced quatrains, something distinctly not Anglo-Saxon in origin, could double as an emblem of Heaney's approach to the distant past and north. Here's the wild thing about Heaney's Heaney experiment. His adherence to what he elsewhere calls the iambic drums improves a lot. When he emerges from what we might call his Viking period and returns to more conventional versification in Fieldwork, 1979, and Station Island, 1984, he displays a level of comfort with metered verse that sometimes eludes him in earlier work. From this point forward, he marries the rhythms in his head to the metrical march of his lines as if he were born to do it. That's the main point about rhythm, isn't it? getting what one imagines onto the page or into the listener's ear seamlessly and naturally. There are as many paths to that one particular waterfall as there are poets. Some, like Frost, are such natural masters of meter that it disappears into the rhythms of speech almost entirely. Some, like Whitman, chart new courses to express their own rhythmic sense in original ways. And some, like Heaney, pursue their own innovations to borrow from other traditions in order to achieve comfort in their own. How poets reach their own rhythmic signatures is always a story unique to them, and we readers respond to both the journey and the arrival.